I mean, people are under no apprehend misapprehension that you learn anything huge. You are fed a very, very strict party line that the great leaders are wonderful people. They are benevolent. They have given us our clothes. They've given us our food. We worship them as deities. Um, and you accept that. And obviously, it's very difficult for people who know everything about that from the outside to then listen to this. And it can become a bit much after three or four days of being sort of fed this constantly. It takes a lot to kind of grit your teeth and think, well, no, this is nonsense. This is not what's happening. There's famine, there are gulags, but you, you absolutely cannot say any of this to them. You can't engage with the guides in that way because it's, it's not just offensive to them, but it's also, it's dangerous because if fellow guides listen to them talk to you about anything that they shouldn't be, they can get into trouble, they can report them and there'll be repercussions that none of us know about. Um, so if you do choose to go somewhere like that, you just have to accept that you will have to place flowers at the feet of the statues of the Kims wherever you go. Um, you will, if you do want to take pictures of the statues, which are pretty much in every city, and there are pictures of them on every wall, in every home, on every train station, um, you cannot crop them. So if you want to take a picture of them, you have to take the head to toe. And if you crop it, it's considered decapitating them. And you'll have your pictures deleted, <laughs> um, which happened at one point when the guides will come over and look at your phone or look at your camera and go through your pics. Um, and one of the, oh, I felt so sorry for him. We had four guides and one of them's called Mr. Song. Um, I remember him just taking a camera from someone <laughs> pressing delete all. And every single one of their pictures had gone and the other guides wound him up from the rest of the trip and called him the deleter. <laughs> Um, and I felt so sad for him because he was quite new and he was just going to get into grip and he just turned really pink in the cheeks and just looked humiliated and obviously terrified. Um, but they, they, the guides are, they're an interesting group of people because they're often diplomats children and they speak fluent English and many of them have actually grown up abroad, which I found quite odd. The two that we had, one had grown up in Beirut from the age of 15 to 21 and another one had lived in Madrid from 10 upwards and I remember saying to our, our English so, so the English guide comes with you from Beijing so Sarah was a very sweet girl from Kingston and I had a chat with her I said Sarah surely if they've lived in Madrid and they've lived in Beirut they know they know everything about the regime they know it's all rubbish why don't they just leave or why do they continue to peddle this and she said well they don't have a choice because when diplomats are sent abroad they either keep one of their children in the country to make them come back or they threaten their remaining family so they could be abroad for seven or eight years, but they still have, they have no choice but to come back. Um, and she said, one of the guides, um, she said, he knows everything and he's acknowledged it to me, but she said his only way of protesting it is when we go and visit the mausoleum where you can actually see the Kims lying in glass coffins with these waxy faces. Um, he always muddies his shoes before he goes as his own form of dirty protest. And you have to be dressed in a tie, Go, you know, women have to be with you've got they check your shoelaces are tied, they send you through this strange tunnel where they blast air at you to blow dirt off you. Um, it's it's all I mean, it's almost there, there are points where you just want to stand and scream because it's so extreme and so ridiculous. Um, and I remember at one point.